So Sandai does insight and analytics around new music. This is pre-release music. Any piece of music out there that has been released but doesn't have any data attached to it, or very little, some things you can't measure. Um, it's all crowdsourced. It's all about crowdsourcing, wisdom of crowds, semantic analysis, a lot of data crunching. We have a database of over 100,000 songs, so we can position any song anywhere within a three-dimensional musical universe, but on a predictive basis. Uh, we work with all the major labels, particularly in the US, most of the major radio groups, and tens of thousands of independent artists. But I'm going to share with you some statistics around music to see why this, this area is so confusing. Every year, around a million new tracks are added to iTunes, Amazon, etc. It's an absolute mass amount of data. Of those million, about 1,000 are major label releases in the US market. Of those 1,000 major label releases, only about 100 make it to the top 20. Um, and if you think that's, uh, that, that's low hit rate, their hit rate in actually getting to the top, top 20 is actually extremely good. They have 49 out of the top 50 singles in the US Billboard top 100 at the moment. If you're an independent artist, the chance of actually making it are pretty slim. One in 7,000 chance to get your album uh, in the Billboard Top 100. So we're talking about the charts, and you may say, well, the charts are all about yesterday's news. Everyone's streaming nowadays. It's all about on demand. It's all about personalized radio. And on one level, you're correct. Last year, about 99% of all song plays in the world were digital, streaming radio, streaming audio. But if you're an advertiser, or if you're a record label, you're not really interested in how many songs are streamed. What you're trying to do is hit an audience. And last year, 98% of the audience was actually listening to mainstream radio. In the US market last week alone, Gautier is someone that I used to know, was heard by 177 million people over a one week period. That's, that's separate people in the US market. Radio is absolutely massive. And that's where the money is. That's where the customers are if you don't want to have to pick them off one by one. So how do you make a hit? Well, the way the re this may come as news to some of you, but the way this works um, in the industry at the moment, if you imagine a baseball as, as a new song that you want to release, really, you want to hit a home run. Uh, and it's, there's a very simple process to do that if you're a record label nowadays, because the labels have learnt how the new system works. First of all, you create buzz. Any marketeers in the room will know that this can be engineered, and that is the easiest and simplest way for a record label to actually operate. For about $5,000, you can buy a million YouTube hits in, over a period of about seven to 10 days. So it's not even that expensive. And the reason they do that is not because they're genuinely um, getting people to like the music. They turn that into a little report, and they give that to their radio promoters who go to the radio stations who say, look, we've had a million hits in a week. This track is absolutely burning. It's going viral. You've got to play it. That's how you get on a playlist. But then, big problem. What if the music's no good? And nine times out of 10, that is the case. The music is not very good. You hit a quality barrier. So call out research from the radio stations. When it actually gets to the audience, tells them that actually they've got a rubbish playlist. So they quickly withdraw it, and then the whole, whole process repeats itself. Occasionally, you do get the odd home run, but may, most often that is accidental rather than deliberate. So this is how the music industry works, and I'm not making anything up here, I think we all know this. It's about create the buzz, then promote it, and then see if the product's any good. Now, I can't think of any other industry that works that way around. Most other people work this way around. Make damn sure you've got a brilliant product, then do some promotion, let the viral buzz work, uh, and break it that way. The in music industry is an incredibly wasteful space. So I suppose the main message, or one of the main messages today, is buzz does not equal quality. And it's something that a lot of people lose sight of. Most of the music industry actually have lost sight of it, and a lot of marketeers lose sight of it. Just because you've got a lot of social interaction going on on the web, it doesn't mean to say people are listening to your product or enjoying your product. Because so many people act on buzz, and because it can be engineered so easily, it's actually, we're in a vicious circle uh, of systemic failure. Um, if you can actually switch that round and put quality at the beginning, if you can test the product before it goes out the door, then there's a huge benefit to everybody in the ecosystem. 
that independent artists, you're democratizing talent. So the best music will get to the top and very, very quickly. It's great for the labels, because they save about 90% of their marketing costs on pointless exercises. It's fantastic for the consumer, and not the general consumer, but the specific consumer. Because if you know how good it is for a 65-year-old in Ohio and a 16-year-old in Paris, you can actually target the music uh, with the product uh, or with the artist. And if you want any proof of this in action, you only need to look as far as Pandora. Pandora is the world's leading personalized radio service, only available in the US at the moment. They have 50 million monthly regular users. And the reason that that is is because they have quality control at, at the doorway. So they don't let a song through the door unless it's proven to be very, very good. Only then do they tag it with about 300 tags. And after they've done that, then they start measuring social interaction and sharing uh, and recommendation. It is a fantastic service. So what does the future look like if we can get quality at the forefront of the music industry? Well, it means the artist on the left there um, actually gets heard. If they're good, it's a meritocracy. Their song flips straight to, to radio, and that's something we're working with a number of radio groups uh, in the US on. Um, for the record label, they stop wasting so much money on pointless exercises. Uh, radio are happy. Their advertisers are happy because the music is good uh, and, and they are very sticky for listeners. For advertisers, it's fantastic. If you're doing personalized advertising on the web and you have five different demographics that you're trying to target in 10 different countries, you can roll the same ad, but you can put 50 different pieces of music behind it depending on who you're targeting because you know which song is going to work with which demographic. And then finally, for, for the consumer, um, it's lean back music. It's just a fantastic experience. Every song is, hits you between the eyes as something great. So final slide, takeaways. It really is all about the quality. Whether that happens at the end of the process or whether we shift, shift it to the front, it's, music is all about quality. The current system is uh, chronically flawed and that's why we're still searching for great music recommendation services. It's not about size. Spotify has about 20 million tracks now. I sit on there and, and scratch my head wondering what to play next. Um, it's very confusing. I want to be fed the stuff. I want somebody out there picking out the great stuff and giving it to me uh, every minute of every day. And if you can get that, that quality and personalization, which Pandora have partly cracked, you end up with killer recommendation, killer advertising, uh, and killer resonance with your target audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Round of applause, David. Do you want to grab your mic? Yeah. We'll just head over here. Um, you know, I, I, I am conscious of the fact that we're old guys, right? We're not young. So can you tell me the difference between the youth? Do the youth expect, like you just said at the end of your presentation, you expect someone to select it for you and send it for you. But there's a whole generation that's grown up with iPods that, have used, that are used to selecting their own songs what diff, or, or their own music. What difference do you see in the discovery of music between the generations? I think when you say people pick for a music, they actually, uh, especially the youth, they, they discover music. Right. They don't necessarily go and listen. There are some people who go and listen to 200 tracks to find one great one. But, um, for instance, we just uh, released an app last week which delivers you one track a day, and it's a perishable track, so it's only there for a day, and you can only save it if you share it. Tomorrow morning, the track's gone. You'll never see it again. But each track... What's the name of your app? Sound out. Oh, the SoundOut app. It's called SoundOut. Is, is, it, is it available in the UK? It's available on Android worldwide and iPhone next week, probably. And it just sends you a track. You get it for yeah. a day. If you share it, you get to keep the track. You don't get to keep it, but you get to tag it, and you can, you can play it again. But the key is every single track is something that's going to be in the charts in four to six weeks' time. You won't have heard it before, but you're going to be a thought leader. Let me ask you this question, because I know we're running short on time, but I, I do want to ask it. Carly Ray Jepsen, yep. right? Canadian, mm -hmm. right? Discovered by Justin Bieber, apparently, right? He went to Canada, heard it, heard, she's 26 years old. It was her song, I forget, Call Me Call Maybe. Me maybe yeah. yeah, huge global hit now. Yep. So did you guys predict that? Yep, it, went, it was through the roof. It was over 80%, 85 so, But did you know that that was going to happen, that, that, that Carly Rae Jepsen, that, it, that Justin Bieber would find it? Or was it once Justin Bieber discovered it that it became a hit? Once we tested it, we could tell it would be a hit, provided it gets to radio.
Provided it gets to radio. Okay. So is there any test? Like, could we run a test with you at some point and bas basically get a band? Is there an algorithm you, like, here's the question. So sorry, everyone. I'm meandering. I'm tired. Okay. Um, you, you're in a studio with a band, right? They're making yeah. a band. Could a band bring all of their, their album uh, or, or all of their songs to you and say, are any of these going to be hits? Do you guys have that ability? Yep, and we do. Um, the, 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 cons the retail side of the business means you can, you can test music broadly for as little as $30 a song. It goes up a lot above that if you actually want to do demographic targeting by geography. But as a starting point, you can put 10 tracks up, and a lot of artists do test them $300 down the line, they've got a pretty good idea. Of and and they get great feedback are. on that. Oh, fantastic. It's all powered by written reviews. So wow. I, thank you so much for coming. It's thank been a, it's great. It's a great insight. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you. Okay. That's David uh, Corche Dutton.